Welcome back to Think Design Work Smart. I'm Alex Bulbock and I'm coming at you from the Mosaic Work Studios. And what I have for you today is a deeper dive into a question that I keep seeing around the internet and a question that I want to answer because I'm, I also did a deep dive into design patterns recently. And the question is, are design patterns outdated? Are design patterns useless nowadays? Have we solved the problems that design patterns were showing or were attempting to solve? And let me give you a bit of a background on this. I was um, doing a deep dive into design patterns, really studying each of the patterns. And I ended up with prototype. I would well, I was actually at the prototype design pattern and I was trying to figure out what are some modern usages of prototype. In case you don't know, prototype is fundamentally the idea. It's a creational design pattern where you have a, an existing object and from that you want to create a new object that's exactly the same. And um, this is typically done using a clone uh, method. So you call clone and you get a clone of that uh, object. And I could see some issues with prototype today. Um, and so I went to social media trying to figure out what are some examples of using prototype today. Because I think we've learned a few things since we started, but I'm going to go into a deeper dive uh, later on. And... Um, Besides the very helpful answers regarding prototype, people telling me this is how I used it, this is how I'm using it today, which were kind of in line with my uh, initial thoughts. I also got the, a, good, uh, a good dose of kind of design patterns, how would I call it, denialism. <laughs> People saying that, you know, no, design patterns don't deserve the name and are not useful and I don't remember them anyway and, and so on. And what, what was most surprising to me is that these answers came from people who post generally extremely interested things on social media about software development. So I appreciate their contribution to the field. But when we came to this, it's like we were speaking different languages. And I heard that this is a theory in the internet, the design patterns are outdated and useless and so on. And so I want to discuss it head on. Um, I think it's important to to reopen this topic, which actually hasn't closed. Many people assume that design patterns are only, you know, the Gang of Four book, which came out in 90 something. Uh, so it's 30 years old. And since then, uh, many things have changed and therefore those design patterns are outdated. But first of all, that's not true. And Design patterns have had a deep influence. You are probably using design patterns today, perhaps without even knowing. The, and the second thing is that those are not the only design patterns. There's a whole community of people working on developing new design patterns and there are books published and articles and so on on various areas of software development. Uh, because design patterns are not limited to the technical aspect, to software design, but we apply them to organizational design. Maybe you've heard about team topologies. It's basically a pattern book. If you are using domain-driven design, you are basically using design patterns. A different set of design patterns, well, slightly different. We still have factories there uh, sometimes. But repository is a design pattern. If you do use dependency injection, that is a design pattern. So we have this idea that somehow 
design patterns were old outdated we are not using them anymore they are obvious um, and so on and that just puzzles me to no end and so i want to give you a quick introduction into why i don't believe that design patterns are outdated and why i believe they are useful but trying to frame this in a helpful way in a way where we can actually have a conversation around the different patterns and you know if they are useful today if they are not so useful and i feel that one of the reasons why some of these design patterns are no longer useful is because of the current landscape i was talking about prototype one of the reason for cloning things is that you want to for example drag and drop up objects in a user interface and that typically applies to desktop applications but now these desktop applications have kind of moved to uh, the web because basically what you are doing with your single page applications is a desktop application only it runs on a different operating system which is the web so we are kind of going in these circles but the prevalence of people who are working now on um, user interfaces smaller than it was uh, when this book was written. I mean, back then, somebody would write the whole application from the user interface to the database. And so you needed to know how to make the user interface. And, and it was typically a desktop application so you had to know your way around widgets and all these kinds of things whereas now i think most programmers work on the back end and when you're doing back end stuff you don't need as much to clone objects there but this doesn't mean that it's the pattern is not useful it's just that the landscape of software development has changed and now we are using uh, other patterns more and this pattern less. Uh, so there are all kinds of interesting things happening here. But let's get started. So the first question that I'd like to answer because it's very important is what are design patterns? People assume that design patterns must be something I don't know, very complicated or very um, or very academic or but it's not that because design patterns are harvested. What this means is that you look at you see the same problem in multiple code bases and you see people ending up on similar solutions. And that's how you get to clarify and to define a design pattern. You start giving it a name, you give it a, define the problem that it solves, define the, ver the variants of solutions um, that you propose and or that you have seen. So a design pattern goes beyond the normal design talk let's say so if we think about object-oriented design what we have is we have some building blocks and the fundamental building blocks are objects that contains data and methods and objects have relations between them a composition and then you have um, the classes that are the representation of objects that can have a relation of inheritance and this is where you start with your design and then we talk about the different uh, elements in the design and the different outcomes of structuring the code in a certain way and with some structures you get increased coupling with others you get lower coupling you get increased cohesion you get lower cohesion oh yeah so you 
are trying to organize this code in a way that optimizes for change, typically. Although sometimes it can be for performance or for other things, but generally speaking, we want to be able to change code. And because of that, we try to organize things in a way that optimizes for that. Now, on top of that, we discuss about design patterns, and design patterns would be the next level, would be, okay, so I have this problem, and I think I have seen this problem before. Let's see if there's a solution for it. And perhaps the solution, let me give you an example, one typical problem that I see, you have tests, and in your unit tests, you need to create very complex objects. And if you ever need to change the constructor, for example, by adding a new argument or removing an argument or changing the meaning of an argument, or you need to add a new property in case it's a constructor and then you need to set, I don't know, 30 properties, then you will need to go into every test that creates such an object and modify the code there at this property which is mandatory and which wasn't there before. And that's a problem because what this means is your tests are coupled with your implementation. And one way of dealing with that is called the builder pattern. Instead of doing that, you create a builder object which allows you to create such objects that are valid. And if you are using the builder pattern, adding a new property that is mandatory for a specific object would mean just going into this uh, builder pattern, adding a new line of code that sets that property, and that's all. You have a valid object in all your tests that you had until now. Now, after that, you need to go and then more tests, depending on the behavior you're introducing uh, that's related to the new property, but it's a completely different thing, and it's an, basically the new development. So, this is an example of design patterns. Now, in some languages, you can do the builder pattern because the language allows you to do builders or in some frameworks, or with certain unit testing libraries. But it doesn't mean that the pattern is not useful. The idea of the pattern goes beyond the idea of, you know, the just this implementation. And I think this is a big confusion that people make. They look at the a diagram, they look at examples of implementations for a specific pattern and they say, oh, it's actually not that useful because it's just, you know, composition is just inheritance. Of course it is. <laughs> you are still building on top of the normal building blocks that your paradigm, your design paradigm offers you. But when you go on top of that, the next level of conversation is a design pattern. So, and what's so surprising to me about this whole story is that it doesn't matter whether you want to use patterns or not, you are using them anyway. Let me repeat that, you are using design patterns today, whether you realize it or not. And the reason is, it's in the way our brains work to figure out patterns and to reuse those patterns. Now, you might not have given them a name, but I can bet you that if you look through your code base, you'll figure out that there are things that repeat themselves. Structures, code structures, types, uh, type combinations. Uh, or if you are doing some kind of functional programming, you know, certain functional compositions. A monad is a design pattern. Okay, it's a solution to a specific problem. So, these are all 
things that you are using, whether you want to or not. And so it comes to me very strangely to to hear things like design patterns are outdated and we actually don't need them and they are part of the language. Once certain constructs become part of your language, of your programming language or of your technology, what you will do naturally is to create design patterns that are one level higher and that combine those building blocks that are now one level higher into things that are even uh, another level higher. So discussing about design patterns needs to happen at the right level of abstraction, at the right level of zoom in, okay, or zoom out. If you zoom in all the way, everything is code or everything is functions. You zoom it slightly more, you have function or functions and data structure, right? You can write any programming, any program with a set of functions and a set of data structures combined in a specific way. No problem with that. If you go higher, you might get types, you might get, you know, different types of building blocks. But on top of that, you'll always have certain combinations that repeat themselves. And maybe they are not the gang of four design patterns, because let's assume those are already built in. But it's extremely useful to have a name for those, to have a structure defined, variations, to have a description, a solution, a description of the problem they are trying to solve. And let's not forget, there's another thing that developers tend to forget. Look, and this uh, will probably sound controversial. Design is a humanistic endeavor. Yes, you are dealing with code, you are dealing with organizing structure, but why are you organizing structures? Computer doesn't care. You are organizing structures so that you, who are a human, or your colleagues, who are also humans, understand that structure and are able to modify the structure in specific ways. Right? This is why we are doing this. So design is fundamentally humanistic. What this means is that there's another thing that's important for software design, which is called intent. The intent that you put in the structures that you create for your code is probably more important than the structure itself. Because if you manage to figure out what the intent is, if you manage to structure the code based on that intent, that will just mean that you have good design. It just leads there naturally. If you don't have a clear intent in what you are trying to do, then you might be picking up all the design patterns and grouping them together and you end up with something that is meaningless or not very useful or too abstract for what it's supposed to do. So, uh, design is a humanistic endeavor, it requires intent, which means even if you have, and there are some situations where certain design patterns have the same structure, and you look at those and you say, okay, what's the difference? Well, there is a difference, the difference is in the intent, and this is why they have different names because the structure is less important than the pattern itself. You can implement the pattern with different structures and with different implementations in different languages, and perhaps you'll find another structure that is not yet documented, but the idea of the design pattern is the same. So, this means that you'll be talking about design at a higher level. 
and that is helpful because you are creating a jargon for the design conversations that you are having. And we talked about jargon before. Remember, domain-driven design, if you're doing domain modeling, what you're basically doing is creating a jargon. If you are doing ubiquitous language, you are creating a jargon. This is a jargon, but that applies at a lower level. So you have a jargon for the domain, but then you need a jargon to discuss about the slightly more technical aspects about how things work together. And again, if you look at domain-driven design, which is something very used uh, nowadays, you have various design patterns there. And it's no surprise that some of the people who come from the patterns community are now very active into the domain-driven design community. Because the two need to each other, right? Domain-driven design needs these patterns. Okay, so... Aren't design patterns old and therefore outdated? As I said, uh, Genga for 30 years old, but there are other design patterns that are much newer. Does, and also, does this mean that because something is old in software development is outdated? And the answer is absolutely not. Software development, despite what people think, it's not necessarily at the age of innovation all the time. Um, what we are basically doing, or, or what we have been doing for the past 30, 40 years, is going in circles, or going kind of in a spiral. Okay, Cloud is the new mainframe. It's fundamentally the same idea, only with better you know, shinier tools, better technology. It can scale up and down better. Um, it probably has not as much security on mainframes in some points. Um, so on. Okay. Um, what else? Microservices. It's just object-oriented programming taken to a higher level where you take objects and you deploy them and we have same problems with them only amplified by the fact that it's now a distributed system and that we have huge numbers of objects that communicate through networks and it's very difficult to figure out what's going on there uh, and of course i'm being a little facetious here there are some changes, but there weren't many fundamental changes in the way we do software. It's basically the same ideas recycled, restructured. So when it comes to design patterns, some of them are old, some of them are newer. Some of them are less useful in the current landscape, but that doesn't mean that they won't be useful when the landscape changes, because the landscape will change. If we know one thing about software development is that the landscape changes in kind of this spiral way, but the really fundamental ideas, they stay there and we just recapture them and reuse them in the new landscape when their time comes again. Um, and there's perhaps no better example for this than uh, functional programming. We, a few years ago, we, everybody was moving to functional programming because it's so much better and so on. Yeah, it started in the 50s. It's not a new idea, but it got new, a, a fresh breath of oxygen, let's say, <laughs> because we 
went back in the cycle of software development back to those ideas. And so I'm really in favor of understanding deeply the core things that are part of software development and that are very unlikely to change. And I believe design patterns is such an idea because of how our brains work. We are naturally looking for patterns. We are naturally copying patterns. We are naturally identifying patterns. Your brain is basically a pattern matching machine. It can f find out, you know, finger out faces and all that, all through pattern matching. So, uh, I believe this is a core idea that will stand the test of time. Now, from time to time, developers will say, yeah, but it's not as useful now as it was and blah, blah, blah. You're still using patterns. You're just using another set of patterns, maybe. Although I would argue you're probably using the, the gang of four patterns anyway, um, and sometimes without even knowing. Uh, the next question was, design patterns don't deserve their name because they are obvious, for example, prototype and adapter. And first of all, a design pattern is a solution to a problem in a context, which means it doesn't matter whether the problem is obvious or the solution is obvious. And by the way, obvious is very subjective. What is obvious to you might not be obvious for somebody else. I made the mistake in the junior years of my career of thinking that there is a common sense between developers and that we could all understand you know, we could all talk to each other and kind of start from the same ideas and understand each other. That's not true. <laughs> Common sense is just built from the patterns that we are seeing. <laughs> okay. And think about how it happens in society. It's exactly the same way. You see people behaving in a certain way. That's how your children will probably behave. So... Um, Maybe design patterns are obvious today because they were in, used in various programming languages and you've seen them much more than when they were first documented. So think about that. Maybe that's why you find them obvious. And so in that case, they were extremely successful. <laughs> Once the design patterns become obvious, okay, maybe we forget their name doesn't matter i don't care that much about you know particularly if you don't use design patterns every day or you don't use a specific design pattern every day absolutely you just have your own set of tools that for your own bag of tools that you are using perfectly fine i don't expect everybody to know all the patterns i don't know all the design patterns by heart but this is why we have catalogs. And at least knowing that, you know, ah, I've seen this solution someplace. It's almost even better if you can replicate a design pattern without knowing that it is a design pattern. Uh, there's a saying among people who, who learn multiple languages, like human speaking languages, not programming languages, it, is that you learn the grammar and then you speak the language and then you know that you are a good speaker and that you've mastered that language when you forget the grammar. It's kind of the same with design patterns, right? Um, you become a better designer by knowing the design patterns, but do you need but yeah, later on you use them and you forget their names. And that's perfectly fine. The, the thing is, you're still using design patterns. It's just you don't know how they are named. Uh, there's not really a problem. 
Now, it would be nice to be able to have conversations based on design patterns, but for that, what's even better is to define the design patterns that you are using in your current project, give them a name and discuss in those terms rather than in terms of, uh, you know, the gang of four design patterns, which maybe you are not using or that are kind of part of the landscape and you forget about those. And then um, this uh, remark came in the, in the context of prototype and adapter. So let me show you something interesting. Actually, yeah, it, it relates also to the next one. Are in design patterns just class and object composition and inheritance? And I already touched on that. Composition and inheritance are lower level uh, relationships. A design pattern comes on top. And every design pattern uses composition and inheritance, but it uses them in a very specific way. Now, if we look at the adapter design pattern, if you don't know, um, this the composition version, it actually has two versions. What the adapter does is allows objects with incompatible interfaces to collaborate. So I want, let's imagine I want to call a web service uh, or payment web service and I have my client that well, my class then needs to make that call. But later on, I change the provider. So I'm moving from payment service A to payment service B. And it's kind of the same, but not exactly the same. So what can I do? I could change the code in my class that in the caller, or I could do another thing, which is to introduce a kind of a middleman, which is called an adapter that takes the information from my class and calls the web server, web service in a different way with what it needs. And there are two ways to do that. Um, one of them is using a uh, composition. And in that case, you'd basically wrap uh, the client of the web service into your class. And that's why it's also called wrapper. You probably know this. Um, and this looks as if it's just composition. But then showing you that there are the idea goes on top of just composition. An adapter also has a second form, which is using multiple inheritance. Now, the only thing is that we don't have multiple inheritance in Java. And so you might not know multiple inheritance anymore. And it's become a little bit frowned upon to do multiple inheritance. It created a bunch of problems, which meant that we kind of eliminated it from our programming languages. But it's still possible to do in like C++. I'm not sure about Python, actually. So, and I think we could find additional ways of doing this using, for example, generics, um, templates, and other, other types of uh, constructs. We might even find a functional way of doing this through various method composition uh, options. So does this mean that this is not a design pattern? Well, of course it is, because it solves a problem in a context. The structure is separate from the problem is separate from the solution. Now, just because the composition version looks like 
fundamental or simple composition between classes doesn't mean that that's not a design pattern. It just means that you've only seen one solution and it only means that that solution is the the most common variant at this point in time but that only tells something about the landscape of software development the landscape of software development has moved such that we don't use multiple inheritance as much and because of that we use the other solution should we forget about the adapter design pattern just because the structure happens to be nowadays uh, in a specific way? I don't think so. I think we should still learn it, understand what it does, and then you know forget the name because it doesn't really matter. You'll just apply the different. Uh, uh, possible solutions. We can even try to generate more solutions to uh, this because it's a really interesting design exercise. Uh, what about prototypes? So I was mentioning that I have some issues with prototype. Prototype is basically, it's a creational design pattern that lets you copy existing objects without making your code dependent on their classes. Um, and what this means is that each you have a base class, which is the prototype, and then you have various implementations. The common use here is for UI widgets, where you have a widget class, and then you have uh, different implementations. So imagine you need to display a list of things you define a list item that defines how the one item from the list is shown. Um, and that list item can be cloned and then the data can be modified. Or you could create thousands of those list items. So there was some usage in um, UI widget domain, and if you are making any UI widgets, you might have encountered this. Now, we don't do that as much nowadays because the landscape has changed, and now we are doing most web applications. But people still use the prototype design patterns, for example, for dragging and dropping things, because when you drag and drop an object, you are basically dragging and dropping data and you want to clone the data without knowing the type of, of that data. So this is where prototype comes in handy. It just happens that with the current landscape, this is not as used as it was before. It also doesn't help that there are two types of cloning. One is shallow and one is deep clone. Confusing the two can be pretty annoying. It leads to a bunch of uh, issues. Deep cloning means to recreate or to duplicate each referred data member in the class, which might mean taking a lot of memory. So there are a bunch of issues with cloning but that are pretty complex, but that's also a function of increasing graphs of objects. If you only had two, three, five objects, cloning is pretty easy, even deep cloning. But if you have uh, like uh, very large objects, um, then it's not uh, like a very large graph if you have hundreds of objects. Okay. So, does this mean that the, these design patterns don't deserve their name because we, they are obvious and we know the solution? I don't think so. I think they should be named. Now, should you remember their name? Like, you know, uh, when somebody asks you? Not necessarily. I don't think so. And often what I would do is to think, oh, I think I've seen this before. And 
I know what kind of pattern it is. I might look into the book or no. Patterns are everywhere, so you can find them pretty easily. Design patterns, next thing, are not just class and object composition and inheritance. They are above that. You have variants of structure that use object composition or inheritance. Obviously, like you would have variants that are using, in case of a functional programming, you'd be using the functional building blocks. All right. Um, aren't design patterns already implemented in programming languages? And there's a variant of this. I've seen that somebody proved that you can eliminate uh, many design patterns with things like aspect-oriented programming and with... But once again, they are, we are discussing at the wrong level of conversation. The correct level of conversation would be these design patterns are what they are. <laughs> okay. Now, in some programming languages, some of them might be implemented. In some technologies, some of them might be implemented. Um, you are, maybe you are just seeing them again and again, and you are using them without knowing, and they are obvious. Fine. So does this mean they are no longer useful? No. <laughs> Maybe those design patterns that you already have in your programming language can, you know, you forget their name once again. You speak the language without knowing that you speak the language. But then you go one level higher. And you might say, okay, we can implement like wrapper, adapter, strategy, I don't know, using aspect-oriented programming or dependency injection, which by the way is another design pattern, or functional composition or types. Okay, cool. You'll still need higher level patterns. I mean, you don't need them, but they will be there anyway. And you might make a better environment for having conversations around design if you define those patterns. Last one, my favorite thing, and in this case uh, it was types, are better than design patterns anyway. And this annoys me to no end, <laughs> really. I never understand the need of developers to bash techniques in favor of uh, promoting other techniques. Honestly, I, I don't get that. So from my point of view, what I have is a toolbox. I may be using types, I may be using tests, for test-driven development, I may be using design patterns, I may be using, I don't know, functional programming and functional composition and all those things, and lambdas, and I don't see a conflict between those. What I want is to get a harmonic mix of these things that I can work together. But in order to get there, First, I need to deeply understand what those things are, what's their philosophy, how they are working, when they are applicable, and so on. And look, I've been pretty open in, on this channel with the fact that I don't particularly like very strong types. And I have a few videos on that, and I also explained why. I also think that we are missing something, which is modules with very strong boundaries. And I think that one of the reasons that we uh, fall back on types is because we don't have modules with strong boundaries. I would rather have modules with strong boundaries, 
and types that are transparent that I don't know that they, they exist um, that don't bother me that don't make me do the work of the compiler uh, than having this but I will never bash types I think types and strong types I've seen people using them they are perfectly valid technique it's not my preferred one but I've tried it I, I've uh, read the books I've done a bit of uh, uh, pair programming with people who are using very strong types and try to learn as much about this as possible does this mean that uh, no we should use design patterns and not types and so on and again it's the wrong level of conversation because types will group into design patterns it's natural the way you're using types will end you into design patterns maybe not the gang of four design patterns maybe some other design patterns but you will get design patterns and you'd better be aware that they are there document them and you know use them because it leaves it raises the level of conversation about design so if you take one thing out of it is I would strongly advise you to study design patterns but really study them in detail to understand what the reasoning is why uh, what is the problem they are trying to solve what is the structure maybe think about their applicability nowadays think about how they um, can be implemented of different structures that work for your programming language um, or even better or and even better look at your code base and try to figure out the patterns that you are using and start documenting those you know we should be writing a design language for our software that goes beyond just the basic things and part of it is the domain model from domain driven design but part of it is how you express all the things that you need in your code based on that domain model and I don't care if you're using types, functional programming, um, object-oriented programming, class-oriented programming, which is basically what many people are doing nowadays. Um, I don't care which one you are using. But don't confuse the notion of design pattern with the structure. When we talk about the structure, it's a different thing than when we talk about the the pattern the pattern is one level above the structure all right so this is my uh, reaction rant <laughs> deep dive into design patterns and how developers are seeing design patterns today i hope you find this interesting uh, if you have any comments please let leave some comments you can be for or against if you if there's something that you didn't understand if you have any additional questions please leave them in the comments we love comments we answer comments sometimes we make videos uh, based on your comments so it's always interesting to have a conversation with you um, the audience because the goal of this is for you to to learn something new with every uh, video that we are making Thank you kindly for the view and until next time, remember to think, design and work smart. See you next week.